Goeiendag, computers en graphics, beelden. Wat doe je ermee? Wat kun je met een computer doen met beelden? Een schilder schilder een schilderij. Maar iemand die met een computer werkt, die kan veel verder gaan. Die maakt een plaatje, maar daar kan hij dimensies aan geven, diepte. Maar hij kan er ook allerlei trucjes mee uithalen. Vandaag praten we met iemand die dat gebruik van beelden, het manipuleren van beelden, helemaal in de vingers heeft. Zijn naam is Laurent Carpenter en hij is de uitvinder van het Cinematic systeem. Dat is een systeem, en dat ga ik zo meteen ook even laten zien, waarbij je mensen in de zaal niet op een knop laat drukken, maar een heel simpel gevalletje hebt. Een, een wond, een, een, een stokje met een groen en een rood dingetje. En daarmee kun je dan door de manipulatie van het beeld kijken hoeveel mensen behoort voor of tegen iemand stemmen. Dat is een stukje van de technologie, maar Lorne heeft veel meer dingen gedaan. Hij heeft uh, enige roem bereikt en hij heeft zich zelfs tot de ACM Computer Graphics Hall of Fame is die, uh, gerezen. Dus we gaan praten over computers en graphics. Welkom, Lorne, in de oh. show. I explain a little bit in Dutch what, uh, what is this all about. And, uh, well, tell me, this seems like a very simple device. It is. Yeah? Uh, how does this relate to computers? Okay. Uh, what what this is is uh, a sh what we know what is known as a sheet retro reflector. It's a material that sends light back in exactly back out exactly the same way it came in. So if you hold it up to a light next to your eye, you can see it shining. Very similar to the uh, kind reflective of stuff refle you have on uh, uh, car plates. Car plates, exactly, or safety tape and that sort of thing. Uh, for uh, jackets and such, but this is extremely efficient. So I could put this 200 meters away with a small flashlight and it would be very bright. Anyway, what we do is we use this for uh, interacting with the computer. And the way it works is you have a room with a big screen and several hundred people or a thousand people and all looking at the screen. And somewhere in the room, or it can be outside, we have a video camera, or two or three, watching the audience. Next to each camera is a strong light, maybe 50 watts, maybe 500 watts, depending on the distance, usually about 100 watts. And the light uh, illuminates the wands that the people are holding up. And typically they hold them up at eye level, shoulder, whatever is comfortable. And so the video signal then shows all the colors that they're holding up. And so we have them uh, use the red and the green to signal their intention. Sometimes we have we, we do polling, sometimes we play games, sometimes we have them cooperate, sometimes we have them compete. We can have one team, two teams, three teams, but it's extremely exciting and it's an amazing yeah. psychological Just bring it phenomenon. down to, to present day level. If in California, sorry, in Florida, <laughs> the recount <laughs> doesn't work. This is this is what you could use in in like convention halls. Or in, instead of using electronic buttons, which many convention hall, uh, halls yes. have, yes, here you could have a stadium with people voting for or against whatever That's candidate right. or motion. Yes, you can. Uh, now, there's uh, being as how this is video and it's free form, so people can wave their arms all around and get excited and yeah. jump around. There's a little bit of imprecision in the total, but on the other hand, it's 30 times a second, so or 25 times in Europe, and so we have we can read the color that a person is holding up five times in the time it takes them to change their mind. So the audience has real-time control over the image they see. Mm. There's less than 100 now, milliseconds. I, I was delay. mentioning conventions because that's that's an easy, you know, political uh, meetings. But but uh, what else do you do with it? Can you do games with this? We do games. Um, we do uh, a lot of corporate theater. That's a situation where you have a sales meeting or an annual meeting of a company, and they want to bring all their employees together or some subset of the employees together and tell them what they're going to be selling or how to how the new uh, company's structured or whatever. And an often oftentimes this means uh, some team building is necessary to get them all organized and working in the same direction. And so we're uh, called in to provide a team building experience. And so we uh, have the, the groups play games together, compete. Excuse me, but the cooperate. image that I get is that, you know, these people are playing a game and then one guy from the audience said, do we want to get rid of the CEO? 
<laughs> well, in fact, that did happen. <laughs> yes, um, we've done shows where the um, the management really wanted some input from the employees, and so the employees were given ones, and we set up a voting system where they could do that. And uh, the the management was giving their presentations about how the next year's planning, and every so often they would say, "Do you think this is a good idea or not?" And most times, employees would say yes, and sometimes they said no. And when they said no, the management was quite shocked because they thought it was a good idea. And this would have meant that had they attempted to implement that, the employees would have sabotaged it subconsciously so, or so otherwise. So it's, it's a way – now, let's, this is very practical. And you, you uh, introduced this or, or you have shown this at the um, Ars Electronica in Linz, which is like a major European platform for new – computer graphics uh, things uh, but you've been working with uh, with um, with computer graphics for a long time tell me a little bit about that what, what are you doing now okay well I started in computer graphics in the night in 60s in 1960 Wait a moment. did we have screens in those days no we didn't have screens we didn't have frame buffers we didn't have color we except had lights pens we? we had paper and we had printers and we had plotters for like uh, drawing pictures. And punch pictures cards, and we still and have punch those. Cards. In oh Florida. yes, <laughs> I have punched hundreds of thousands of punch cards. My back when I punched punch cards, um, <clears throat> and uh, so yeah, I was drawing pictures in uh, in the sixties with the computers. Um, and, and, and you mean pictures that would print on paper? Line drawings, line drawings on line paper. Line drawings on paper. Yeah, that we know that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That the word IBM would show with you know with lots of letters bi yeah. being built up, yeah, that sort yeah. of thing. A little yeah. I've, I've worked out the, the mathematics of three dimensional perspective and so forth uh, for line drawings uh, back when that was all you could do. So um, anyway, I worked at Boeing in Seattle as a as a programmer, engineer, uh, computer science guy, and got my degrees and so forth. And then I went to work for Lucasfilm in 1980, 81. And uh, we developed there the RenderMan software, which is used by every major studio in the world, and for which I and a few other people won a Technical Academy Award. And uh, then Lucasfilm... Um, wait, wait, let, let's... Let, RenderMan is a program that helps you not only design something, but get into, like, live well, 30 frames a second or 25 uh, frames a second images, yes, which then... Right. What it is, is a, it's a renderer. It's a program that takes geometry, uh, polygons, curves, what have you, uh, textures, lighting, camera information, so forth, and it creates a synthetic image. And effectively, it's, uh, I, I like to refer to it as a camera of the imagination. Let, let's take the example, the dinosaurs that many people see here in the BBC yes, the uh, series, mm -hmm. or in other uh, Lucasfilms, actually. Uh, those are created totally out of the imagination. You yes. might have used the skin of uh, some animal as a as a texture, right. but for the rest, the movement, everything is artificial. It's done on the computer. That's right. Yeah. And what the renderer does is that it produces the individual frames. Someone has to animate the character. Someone has to build the character. Someone has to set up the shot in terms of you know the the cinematography part of it, but. When all that is done, there's a piece of software, an enormous piece of software, that actually writes out the file with the images in it. Yes. And that's the renderer. And um, that's what I do. That's my, my uh, day job. So, so basically what it does, it, it say on the screen of 780 by 576, it decides at every moment what color and what exactly. luminance it produces. This the pixel has and and all those pixels together constitute a frame exactly and if you have 30 frames a second or 50 frames a second or 25 as in european video you get an image and mm -hmm. you have the impression you see those dinosaurs walking that's right there's millions of little colored dots and every color for every dot has to be determined exactly yeah. now, is that i mean are you there saying okay this has to be red or is this mathematics how do you decide what, what i mean mm. what does a renderer do okay uh, on, on computer terms ah uh. Well, let's say you wanted to draw a picture of um, a rectangle yeah, a with rectangle. a picture on it. Yeah. And so what we would do is we would say uh, in world space, um, that is to say in some XYZ coordinate system containing the object and the camera both, so they have a, a common reference, 
we would say where the corners are of this surface. We would say where the camera is, which way the camera was pointing, uh, the field of view of the camera, and you know, whatever terms you like, lens, f-stop, I don't care, okay. angle. And then how you want the surface to be colored in. Is it a solid color? Is there a light on it? Is there a texture? Does it have bumps? All those things have to be specified either by images or programs that's, that say, for this point, I want this but color. That sounds like a lot of mathematics. It's like you it's have the corner of this, one yeah. cube that is now in this point, and you've decided it, w it has to be like in five seconds on that point, so that's so many frames, that's 150 right. frames, so it's going to divide the length divided by mm -hmm. the number of frames and says, okay, in five seconds that point has to be there, so the next second it has to move a quarter of an inch or two pixels to the right. So now the yep. point two pixels to the right from the previous point has to be the corner point of the... And so that has to be done for all those... Everything, color, texture, all the time. Yes, all the time. Now, There's in the old days, of operations. I've, I've heard words like render farms. You know, mm -hmm. Lucas Films, they had to render farms, lots yeah. of computers, each doing individual frame and working out all these, all these uh, motions and colors. Today we have uh, Pentium 4, I heard, 1.5 gigahertz, mm -hmm. and the latest word is, people, that uh, the 1.2 AMD uh, processor, which is a, comp a competing one, especially in rendering and in some graphics operations, seems to be faster, so Intel has not the fastest, but it runs the fastest. <laughs> Just a little bit of, uh, of side uh, information on. But we have very fast computers and processors. Mm -hmm. 1.5 gigahertz is quite a step from the 6 and 8 megahertz CPUs that we started with. Our software, our, the rendering software, was originally developed on a digital equipment VAX, which was about 1 megahertz. And it ran well enough on that to produce short films. Uh, but since then, our machines are now several hundred times faster and a thousand times bigger. And it still takes an hour to three hours to make a single frame. At Even movie, on, on the large machines. Movie quality so this frame. Is still, and, but movie quality, of course, is a lot better than video quality. Oh, very much so, yes. Yes, it, like it's like my ten five, times. Five to ten times. Uh, times better, more mm -hmm. wider screen, stuff like that. But you, so you moved in from, say, doing pure mathematics and getting the stuff to, to now you're in the world of uh, special effects. And I, I see you working as a senior scientist at Pixar, and uh, they make these fantastic well, Toy Story, movies. Bugs Life. We have a new movie coming out next year called Monsters, Inc., uh, which is a very funny movie. I yeah. have to say it's very funny. But have you moved from mathematics to more creative uh, applications? Well, the, the basic processes involved in making these images is, is quite mathematical and algebraical and there's just lots and lots and lots of multiplies and adds and divides and so on. But uh, really the, the quality of the films that Pixar makes are determined primarily by the artists. And my job there is to try to make their job easier so that the artists get to see what they, what, what they want to see. That's why we wrote this tool in the first place. Well, well, wait, wait a moment. Now we, we get to, like, television making in, in the old days, that was done on film, and people would, you know, glue the film together and scissor it. And then we came to the point where we had uh, avids or, you know, computers. You could see a preview of what's going to happen, and the, the creative guy would sit next to an editor and say, oh, I want it there, and what it there. Mm -hmm. Is this the same with your work, that the yes. guy is sitting there, and he's not seeing the full, the full result, but just, like, a, a smaller... Uh, faster uh, preview of it. it. Right, it's the same motivation. It's, it's, the, uh, it's the idea is to get the, the creative person in the loop and get their, their loop as short as possible so that when they make a decision, they see the consequences of that decision as soon as, as, soon as they can, so they can make another decision. So like, again, someone is, is working on a dinosaur film and he sees the image and says, yeah, you know, I, I miss a little bit of sensation there can we have uh you know dark uh, yeah. clouds and and lightning in the back you know and then the guy starts doing that and then you get mm -hmm. that effect precisely yeah. so but that's not the final product i mean then the, the 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 rendering machines have to do their work and get that lighting really in high detail yeah for the final and then that has to be approved as well before it's it's before we print and someone else has to say and says hey hey wait a moment I don't like that lighting. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So this, the, every every step is approved. As uh, the director or the assistant directors are always in involved. Yeah. Art but director. would you say that that means that your work has gone from algebraic uh, equations to to people? Well, management I would. Or? I'd have to say that that the work in the company has. My work is in both fields. 
um, I work with artists on occasion to find out what it is they need. How, do, how can we make their job easier? And then when I've learned what I can from that, I go back to the tool makers or I go underneath the tool makers to develop and to invent processes that make the tool makers job easier. Oh, wait a moment. Tool makers are people who say, well, if I want to make this image a little bit more watery, yes, or, or you know, They're we want this shining on it. Okay, and they, they make a tool to make things shiny yeah, that we see in the, in the computer graphics field every year you have water bubbling or, you know, whatever Some new effect, effect thing, yeah? yeah, faces, whatever, moving. But you say you go beyond that and you, you design basic algorithms to to make that happen because mm -hmm. you could like you make you could make a circle by saying uh, by by making every point but you design something say oh you want a circle puff you just type circle or in this case you right this basic mathematical or computer ma uh, software machinery that's used by the the tool makers now in our case in Pixar's case Pixar writes all its own software just about all its own software we write the renderer we write the animation system we write the production management system we um, we do license a few things from other people, but generally uh, we write our all our own stuff. And those are the tool makers that I refer to, the people that build the whole interface to the user inter for the animators. And occasionally they need uh, software that works with certain new kind of surface, say, that's it's more flexible than the old kinds of curved surfaces we have. And so that library of software that manipulates those surfaces, cuts them and, and turns them into little triangles or whatever it does, that software has to run as fast as it's possible so the animators and the artists can see what what their consequences of their decisions so that it's interactive and not yeah. not batch, as yeah. we would say. Now, that so. seems to be an art. Um, I, I remember the days of uh, Commodore 64 software where we had 64K mm. and actually wrote uh, programs about text programs. You had to really had to stuff it in. And in those days, Radar Soft was a company that designed maps and, and games. And then, with a very little bit of t code, they could make a whole screen full with forever changing stuff. They made a little... Mm -hmm. And the trick was to go back to that level of machine code mm -hmm. and make it run within within the confines of 64K, which you, I think you, the next email is 64K. Yeah? <laughs> Five words, and then we have format, uh, stuff like that. And I like that. And I, it feels like many developers today <coughs> have lost that art, that, that grip with the with the basics of it. They have. They have, yeah? Um, well, just, how do I put it? Uh, a lot of what we want to do today is more complex than what we used to do in the sense that, well, we know how to do that. We want to add this and we want to add these features and we want to add this whole different way of working on the same thing. And so you end up with these enormous C++ programs that take uh, five people to understand and no one person really understands it all. So... When that happens, it's very difficult to be elegant. You, ha you can be yeah, elegant. That's what I mean. We miss the, the, real, the real art of the handicraft in, in the code. That you yeah. say, ah, you know, I read that, and that's doing that and that. Sometimes, let, let's take this a little uh, further. We are, we are stuck with Windows and, and Unix and Linux these days. Enormous operating systems. And I sometimes try to, to tell people that writing an operating system really isn't that hard. If you go back to the, you know, what it says, it says yeah. print. Uh, basically, it always says, take this part of the memory, re put it in another place and replace it with this. You know, that's what it does. Uh, simple, simple. Mm -hmm. And if you understand that, you can rewrite, for instance, uh, um, an operating system. And, and it is being done in Palm computers and organizers, and they mm -hmm. write them in very small code. Um, but again, we, we're losing grip with that. So... People think a browser, man, to write a browser is a really heavy job. Well, it isn't. You take a stream of ASCII and you, you take out the, the codes, H1 and whatever, and, and you put them on the screen in a certain way. Mm -hmm. it, it isn't that. But is the world getting you know, out of grips with, their, with mm. the computer basics? Well, they're probably, I think you're, the, the point is taken, well taken, that they're getting away from the machine. The uh, the hardware, the um, anything... And they're even proud of it. Yeah, anything elegant with respect to the hardware is completely forgotten. Uh, the only people who are concerned about the hardware at all these days are the compiler writers. And maybe some a of compiler the... compiler is something that takes 
a program code and, and turns it into machine code. That's right. Yeah. That has to be good because those are that's a competitive sort of thing. People will benchmark compilers to see which one is faster. So, um, but the programs that people write, they're just throwing code at the machine, and, and if it works, they're done. Yeah, so they don't we care if it's fast. Word 10 or, or Office 10, which is the new thing, is like, Jesus Christ, it's you know, gigabytes of code and yeah. not to be untangled. And you need 5,000 people to figure out where the bug is. And there are bugs, mm -hmm. of course. Oh, yeah, yeah, you never find them all. You never find them all, and that's... that's uh, but do you think there will be a wave of people going back to, to simple... Um, embedded are, embedded chips and embedded yeah software. the embedded software people are co quite conscious about this sort of thing yeah. embedded by the way is, is is when you want a, a little chip in your head for instance or in your watch which or is a very chip you don't see you don't even know it's a computer it's in your washing machine it's wherever and it does a certain job and a limited job to that mm -hmm. and and so embedded is the technology where the coming years well we already have them in our cars and you know yeah, wherever every vcr has every one. vcr we have we're sitting here with mics within five years we'll have mics with an embedded chip in it maybe there is already yeah doing all kinds of things and that's that's the new way where the the chip will invade yeah. in you know what uh, pervade actually uh, mm -hmm. and th those people oftentimes work with very small space to very cramped working in one in yeah, a yeah they, they don't have the memory space or they don't have the power space Mm, and that's yes, of course that's very difficult. important, yeah, because they can't r have this computer run too much power. No, yeah? that's right. They have to either in a handheld device or it's in yeah, something yeah, so that it's runs it's on power, batteries. Power con conscious. See, the funny thing is that that well, I see this this cinematics system. Yes, that has that it is very far uh, away from writing code, isn't it? Is 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 like something you you invented, you you came up with? Yes. Um, this um, this was invented to have fun, basically. Um, I've been associated. Well, wait with a minute. Is that, is that is that part of the job having fun? Um, part of my life. Part of your life. I mean that that with the way I, I hear it, man. This guy is a scientist. He's a, he's, oh. a, he's a nerd. He sits there thinking about yeah uh, algebraic uh, equations. I well, I walk around when I think. I can't oh, sit yeah. and think. You but I do think a lot. I'm. Probably more than most people. But is is like a studio? Pixar is, is, is yeah. Pixar is an animation uh, animation right. studio. Is is it fun to work? Oh, well, it's a very nice place to work. I like mm -hmm. you know, like working there. It's, yeah. uh, the the people are are all good. I mean, you know, it's a select group of people, and uh, they're all really sharp and uh, really are creative. A bit crazy or not? They come mm, with funny hats. There's a variety of craziness. <laughs> there's a variety of craziness. The yeah. craziest people are the animators. I mean, you, if you know any animators, you'll know that they're really uh, actors. And yeah. they're all extroverts. <laughs> Frustrated and actors. They can yes. do it themselves, so they put That's their little right. puppets out there. And they're, act, they're actors, and yeah. they, they act out all their characters before they animate them. Yeah. Uh, but um, Is there like a, a, a chief psychiatrist in a company like, uh, like Pixar? Uh, I mean, not formally, but is there a guy who watches... <laughs> is there watches a guy the who keeps track of everybody? Uh, well, we have, um, we have people that, that are concerned about the welfare of the employees. Yeah. You know, they're human resources folks, and they're, they're good. Uh, and we try to have uh, places for them, you know, people to relax and, and drinks and so forth to keep you know, keep them from uh, being. You want being them crazy, but not too crazy. <laughs> that's right. They have to be a little a little uh, up all the time. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's a good place. And so, uh, I, how do I get to this? Um, well, let's see. I've well, that, that looks this like like a, a totally different it's not, application. Right. This yes. has nothing to do with Pixar. No, it has nothing to do with Pixar, but but uh, it has to do with the with analyzing an image. Oh, because yes. again, what this you do in, in the video image, as you understand it, you take the video image with all those little lights, green or red, yeah, that's right. and you count them basically. You say how many kind of, kind of, and you have to figure out that if it's uh, this size, it might be two uh, two green things close together, stuff like that. And that's where your algorithms come in, mm -hmm. and you count them. So it's an application of your of your field, but it's also looking into the world and what we need. Mm -hmm. Now, a little bit on the history of this. Um, I've been associated with the SIGGRAPH conference. Uh, that's the Computer Graphics Professional Society annual meeting, and uh, for many years, and but we, we should explain that uh, SIGGRAPH is like a big computer show, but totally dedicated to um, computer graphics and and these days uh, special effects and so on. And when you go there, it's like um, the ITFA we have in Amsterdam, the documentary festival, because they run all those little clips, 
most of those films, those those com computer graphics clips are very short, and uh, you go there and you know they, they, you can vote and there's juries and all kinds of of things, and of course there's the computers that you run on it and the software, and I tell you those I've been to a few in Anaheim and and, and uh, in. Uh, it's usually close to Disneyland, isn't it? <laughs> there's, uh, there's where the hotels are. Yeah, where the hotels are, and <laughs> you can go there. And it's quite fun. All the strange people, uh, when they're in the years of the virtual reality, when that was was hot, and you see many, many of those special effects show up in commercials. So when you see these funny things, you know, cars going popping in around, dinosaurs. That's where that comes from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The uh, the people who make those commercials learned their craft probably at SIGGRAPH or through the papers that uh, the SIGGRAPH uh, members have written. Yeah. And uh, I've written a few of myself. So anyway, being associated with the conference and the film show, uh, one year one of the film show uh, directors asked me if there was something that could be done to make the show interactive. And so I thought about it a little bit and uh, said, well, what you need to do is point, give everybody something to hold and point a camera at them and look at the image and see what they're doing. And she said, well, that sounds like an interesting idea. Are you going to do that? Because I'm not going to do that. I'm too busy. And then I said, well, I'll think about it. So this was to be a year and a half, two years, two years away at, when we were discussing this. And so uh, I went home, and, and I got a phone call five months later. And the person said, you know, they just fired the film show chair for next year, and I'm it. You want to do this thing this year now? And so I had like six months to get ready, where I, before I had, I thought I had a year and a half. So uh, we uh, cobbled together some equipment, scrounged it here and there, wrote some software in a hurry, and Rachel uh, helped me with organizing all the people and stuff, and, and we got uh, 4,000 people to play, to fly an airplane and uh, play <laughs> Pong and whatnot in, in 1991. And uh, I have to say, the system worked the first time we turned it on. I tested it a little bit in my office using a silicon graphics machine to pretend to be the camera v signal and sending images to the uh, to the game computer, which was an old PC, um, so that I knew that it was conceptually going to work. But when we turned it on, it worked. Mm -hmm. The audience became ecstatic, and uh, we uh, decided at that point we probably have a business. So we formed. So you now have cinema. Well, uh, let's see. There's a Cinematrix uh, website, www.cinematrix.com, uh, so people can find you. Now, I take this one step further. S suppose, and I'm this creative process, suppose we gave every Floridian, the person okay. from Florida, a thing like that, and we use all those crazy military um, spaceships like? out oh, there. Yeah, yeah. Little light, you know, get a guy with 20,000 watts or whatever, and then everybody could say, yes, Bush, <laughs> Bush Corp. That is a potential application of this technology. Uh, that's a little far-fetched, but it's not inconceivable that you could, you could read from space or probably more from an airplane. Uh, mostly what we use this for are, are hundreds of people or a thousand people in, a, in an audience, in theaters. Um, but there are other applications that beyond which where, where we can take it. I mean, Rachel yeah. and I have taken this quite a few places. We have installation at Epcot. We have an installation in the Millennium Dome in Greenwich, England. We have an installation. So it's more for the general public That's coming right. there and, and voting mm -hmm. or playing games. They're yeah. playing games. Yeah, yeah. Generally all but could you games. go further? Because what you're now analyzing is, is a simple red or green color thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. But could we come to as far as to analyze facial expressions for uh, Maybe one person then, and then ten, and then a thousand, and then... Eventually, crash. someday, with high, high enough quality cameras. Uh, now, this, this device here produces a very clear signal. It's either red or it's green. It's nothing in between. And it can be seen very far away, and I can have 10,000 of them in a single ordinary video image. And I can discriminate all of them and, and analyze them all in, in a thirtieth of a second or so and feed that back to all 10,000 people right now. If I were to do, uh, let's say we were to do facial expressions, well, each face would take up a significant part of the image. And so even if we could analyze facial expressions, which some people are trying to do, you might be able to get five or 10 people in, the, in one camera view. Yeah, yeah. So to analyze 5,000 people would take 1,000 cameras or 100 very, very good but cameras. But isn't that the, the, the order of magnitude that we see 
you know, coming back to your one megahertz and now we're one point five. It's fifteen. It will happen times. someday. Someday that we we get there because that's the feeling I have that we we are um, technically capable of doing so much more, but we don't see any application. We're still working on uh, word perfect or word uh, oh, word yeah. ten and and you know um, adding more funny macro capability that yeah, turns into that a nobody, virus nobody <laughs> ever uses. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but but so technology will go there, and your work as as a as a computer graphic specialist will not cease to end. Uh, at that time, they will call you in and says, "Listen, the blinking of the eyes. Can you write a little software to to analyze that on on the on the machine?" Yes, there's all there will always be something left to do. I'm sure. Um, yeah. The uh, the the process that analyzes the video image is is uh, quite flexible, and we've yeah. done a number of different methods. Uh, they all work. Yeah. Bring, bringing Pixar and this together, five years ago, ten years ago, people were starting to talk about interact, uh, interactive movies where mm -hmm. the audience or the individual viewer could decide where the story is going to end, mm -hmm. nice or bad or, you know, whatever mm -hmm. the ending would be or what the whole, the whole storyline. Uh, now you can do that on a DVD, you know, within limited things. You can, you can make a point where you say, okay, now you can decide whether you want it to end nicely, you want him to marry with her and stuff like that. But in a cinema that has not yet proven possible, is this kind of technology possible to, okay. to, to, to implement that? There are some things I can say about that. Um, the, uh, there have been a number of, at least two high-profile experiments for interactive cinema, or branching cinema, we could call it, where the story comes to some point where the, the car goes left or right. The audience gets to choose where the car goes, and then if it goes to the left, it has, the op occupants have one experience, otherwise another experience, and so forth. And we found that, uh, I think the, 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 the people who have done this have found that it doesn't work in the sense that, uh, for two reasons. One is, it's bad storytelling. If you, uh, people are in one mode of being passive, watching the story and getting into the characters, and then, whoop, light comes on, show stops. Okay, everybody, now we want you to work. Tell us what you want to do. And then, okay, now we'll start to show up again, and that's... You lost the trance. You, you lost, lost the mood. Yeah. Right. It's just bad storytelling. Um, the other problem is, this is a subtle thing. The, um, the decisions that people make have invariably a cultural bias that can be... Um, there's maybe some variation among the people that, that go in the theater, but on average, 63% or so... If Americans want the, the, the movie to end good, and maybe the Russian 63% want to do, you know, Yeah, precisely. <laughs> yeah. Yes, so, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a cultural preference, shall we say. And all the decision points in these films have a statistical bias to the culture that, yeah, 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 in which yeah, yeah. they're shown. So this is more a philosophical point. You would, you would then have the... Well, this is actually a democratic point. You would have the majority decide what the minority has to see. That's right. And that is a very fundamental point, that you cannot do that. You have to allow the minority to have their day in the, in, in the sun, too. That's an interesting way to put it, because what happens is that, that the audience always goes the same way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then, then there is no need to do it. So you may as well just leave it yeah, that yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. people come back the second time... And they say, well, gee, you know, we went left this time. I want to go right. And they always get outvoted yeah, yeah, yeah. because the people coming in for the first time run right over them. Yeah, I see. Yeah, well, this is, this is what democracy is all, all about, too, is, is, is designing systems that not inherently make it go the way of the majority. Yeah, yeah. Now, well, now, with this system, what we do here is that we try very hard never to put the audience in that situation. We have games, we have tasks, we have uh, tests, so forth, for the audience to, to perform, but never do we stop the show and ask them something. Never do we force them to make a binary decision where some minority of the audience is disappointed. What we do is we have them do things. They control something. So, for instance, if they're flying an airplane and... Uh, half the audience is controlling left and right. And they're controlling left and right by the color they're showing up. Yeah. Well, if, they, if half of them are showing red and half are showing green, the plane goes straight ahead. If there's a target or something off to the one side where they're to fly, some of the people will change their color to yeah. point the plane over there. Others will say, I'm doing the right thing, I'm going to hold it there. But they're all controlling it a little bit. And they all have exactly the same input. 
Mm-hmm. So if if they're trying to track something, then some of the people who are who, who are like to be more active can be more active. The people who are going to be a little slower can be a little mm-hmm. slower, and everybody has a good time, and they're all completely in the loop mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. of controlling it. Um, so this is one of the reasons why they get ecstatic because. Not only does they have a good time, but there's a kind of a linking that occurs in the group, in the mind of the group. That, that uh, they are the power. That's right. They're the power, and they feel it, and they know it. The people have the power, yeah. Quite funny to see that in America at the moment, that we still don't know who's going to be the next president. will come yeah. out, according to our astrologist, in the December 2 to 4 time frame, but uh, that a nation became immobilized in many ways in the stock market because mm. of the fact that they couldn't hold up their... <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <Their> little, <laughs> little, little wens and do this. Well, this was an interesting conversation. Lauren Car- Carpenter, uh, just finished this in Dutch. Ja, we hebben dus gesproken met iemand die uh, aan de basis heeft gestaan van de computer graphics, eh, van het hele begin van eenvoudige computers tot nu werken bij Pixar, bij de, 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 de special effect filmbedrijven, en die een systeem heeft ontwikkeld hoe je in een zaal bijvoorbeeld mensen kunt laten stemmen of spelletjes spelen. En Allemaal toepassingen van computer graphics en allemaal eigenlijk een beetje een blik in hoe de basis van onze samenleving werkt. Dat het lijkt of alles met computers gaat, maar er zijn nog steeds mensen zoals Lauren Carpenter die op het basisniveau moeten nadenken over hoe dat allemaal werkt. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Welcome. Okay.